So welcome. My name is Roger Berkowitz from the Hannah Arendt Center, and we are um, nearing the end of the origins of totalitarianism. The chapter that we're reading today, uh, Totalitarianism in Power, which is chapter 12 of the book, was actually the last chapter uh, in the book when she first wrote it. Uh, there was a short epilogue afterwards. Um, <laughs> But uh, the the, what's currently the last chapter uh, on ideology and terror was not in the book. And even the last uh, three pages of this chapter was not in the book. The book ended uh, at the end in the middle of page 457. Um, and so uh, in many ways, this last chapter on totalitarianism and power um, was for Arendt the end of the book, uh, at least when she first wrote it. Um, the, what comes next, the next chapter, is one of the greatest things she ever wrote, so stay tuned for next week on Ideology and Terror. It's, it's, it's absolutely spectacular, but uh, it did come later. And so in, many, in some ways, we need to think about this chapter as an end and what it would mean as an end. Um, it's within the section on totalitarianism. Uh, and if we recall our guiding definition of totalitarianism from page 323, it is that totalitarian movements are mass organizations of atomized and isolated individuals. Um, and we've talked about masses. Uh, we've talked about movements. Um, we've talked about the, the breakdown of classes. Um, and we've talked a bit about organization in the last chapter. Uh, in the totalitarian movement chapter, but we get in this chapter again more a more uh, a more real and uh, daily in inquiry into what does it mean um, to have a mass organization. But now, not a mass organization that's a movement only that's seeking power, right? But that is in power, and and that's a problem for totalitarianism. Uh, and it's very simple as to why. The very definition or idea of a mass movement for RN is that it needs constantly to break down all institutions, all power structures, anything that resists its ability to consistently um, uh, make the world fictional and thus make the world manipulable. Uh, to the new will of the leader. You have to constantly excite your followers in order to keep them uh, engaged in a movement. You can't have end goals. You have to constantly change your goals. And so the problem is that once totalitarian movements take power, there is a paradox that on the one hand, um, they must uh, now establish what they had originally simply imagined which is a fictional and consistent world as a working reality. Uh, and on the other hand, um, it must remain a movement, totalitarian. It must not seek um, specific goals. It must seek constantly um, to develop uh, and prevent a new stability because it needs to constantly uh, move and excite and mobilize its followers. And so, this chapter is about the paradoxes of the uh, of, of totalitarianism as a movement, and and one of the hopeful uh, um, lessons that we learn in this chapter is that because totalitarianism in power is a paradox, it really is not a long-term danger, right? Totalitarian movements cannot last in power for long periods of time, Arendt thinks. Um, they will burn themselves out because there's just – it's just too difficult to, uh, on the one hand, um, constantly establish a fictional reality and yet also constantly have to say there is no stability and no established reality. And at some point, the, the – uh, the tension between those becomes too great, and totalitarianism in power um, has a tendency and has a has a short, has a shelf life, if you want to put it in in those terms. Um, 
the, the chapter is divided into to three parts, uh, again, as so often she does. Uh, the first is called the so-called totalitarian state. The second is the secret police. And the third is total domination. Um, the first two are more institutional. Uh, they're about how totalitarianism works on an institutional basis in power. Um, the so-called totalitarian state is about how, it, again, it's a paradox. It can't simply become the state because if it does, it will become a kind of stability and it will have a kind of identity and it will um, have institutions that last and that have authority and that will prevent the totalitarian leader from constantly um, reinventing the movement and remobilizing uh, his followers. Um, so that we get these things like duplication and the passing of laws that are ignored. Um, there's no structure in the organization. There, the, there's an attack and a, well, there's, a, there's a multiplication of bureaucracies um, so that you never know which bureaucracy is actually in power. Um, and there's a general principle, she says, that the more visible uh, a power or an agency is, the less power it carries. Power should operate largely in secret and without hierarchy. And all of this leads, she says on page 407, to the atomization not only of the masses, right? It's not only the masses that are atomized in a totalitarianism, totalitarian regime when it's in power, but of the top bureaucrats and functionaries. None of them can trust that they will be uh, around tomorrow. And they ask, so they have to constantly reprove their loyalty to their leader and um, constantly be worried that they may be purged or fired or made uh, irrelevant in some other way or killed. Um, and, and so uh, these are, this is one aspect of the totalitarian uh, regime in power is that the state is, is, is always a so-called state. It's always tentative and tenuous. Uh, the second is the secret police. Uh, and, and, and the reason the secret police rise as uh, elevated um, in, in a totalitarian regime uh, is because it's not simply about dealing with the opposition. It's not dealing with order. It's dealing with terror. Uh, and the essence of uh, totalitarianism in power is terror. You need to absolutely terrorize people, destroy their uh, spontaneity, make them utterly scared of acting in in some way. And the own and the most uh, efficient way to do that uh, is a secret police organization. Um, uh, and we can talk more about that as you will. And then the third uh, uh, stage or the third part of the chapter on total domination, this is by far the, the, the most harrowing and the most um, important part of the chapter. Uh, and, it, and, and yet it's also the most speculative in, in many ways. It's about the camps. Um, and, and her argument here is that it's not an accident that both the Soviet Union and uh, the Nazis uh, made uh, use of the camps. And um, the camps, she calls experiments uh, or laboratories of totalitarianism. And they are um, laboratories in which you experiment with the ultimate goal of totalitarianism, which is the uh, dehumanization the loss of the complete deprep deprivation of dignity and spontaneity and the ability to act and matter of human beings. If you call, recall back to chapter nine, where we talked about human rights and the, uh, the right end of the rights of man, RN, remember, defines human rights and humanity as the uh, right to speak and act and belong to a polity, a public where you can appear and matter. And um, the essence of totalitarianism is the destruction of that common political space in which people can matter and think and act in ways that can matter. 
um, and thus have their humanity recognized and thus have dignity. And the camps are the, um, are the uh, experiments, the laboratories of how and what techniques can be used by the totalitarian rulers to destroy spontaneity in human beings. I mean, another way to think of it is, what do we do, what do, what techniques can we use to make human beings fully complicit, make them walking corpses? Um, and, uh, and, 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 and for our end, the camps uh, are that they are, um, they are the, the, ex the, the way that we can take human beings and experiment and say, how can we make these people complicit in their own dehumanization, make them work for it, make them participate, become uh, capos, right? How can we just so destroy them and their humanity that they will um, willfully engage in the work of a camp in which they destroy their humanity. Um, I, uh, I had, I don't know how many of you were aware of this. I think I mentioned it the last meeting, um, uh, on Wednesday of this week or Tuesday, I forget, uh, I think Tuesday, uh, I think 250 movie theaters around the country showed, uh, uh, the 1984 movie. And I was speaking at Millerton movie theater. Um, it was a great conversation. But, you know, uh, there aren't camps per se in Orwell's imagined um, uh, uh, totalitarian state of Ingsoc, but the, 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 the torture, the, the Ministry of, of Love, where people go to be tortured, um, uh, is a kind of similar experiment and uh, an experiment in how we get, how people can be made to come to be broken uh, in that way. Um, I'll point out one or two of my most favorite um, insights from this section, which is one of the favorite things for me to read of any book. Um, so on page four, uh, 441, uh, RN has this, I think when I first the first time I taught, the first couple times I taught this book, I taught it and I didn't really know what I was doing with it. Um, these are one of those insights that it took, t takes me a couple of years to figure out. She says that we need to dwell on the horrors, right? And I think for a lot of us, or at least for me, when I first read this, I thought that's her point. We need to dwell on the horrors. The horrors and dwelling on them are important because they'll 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 so repel, repel us that we will... Um, learn to avoid totalitarianism. But that's actually not her point. She thinks we need to dwell on the horrors, and yet she says that the horrors can't change us. The experience of the past can't change us. And if any of you have read um, Ralph Waldo Emerson's essay on experience, which I highly commend to you, um, uh, that is actually one of the main points of the opening pages of his essay. He's talking about the death of his son, and the question is, can he experience it? And what he concludes in a certain way in this essay is he can't. The experience of something like that is too enormous that he can't actually get in touch with it. And what Arendt is saying here is actually something very similar, which is that um, we have an inherent tendency, as she writes, to run away from the experience instinctively or rationally. We it's very hard for us to fully encounter a past experience. And so when we dwell on it, we have a tendency to minimize it or categorize it or analogize it and thus reduce it. And in a way, dwelling on it is not going to change us um, enough to make us, uh, in a sense, inoculated from totalitarianism, if anything can. And so... Um, she then continues and says, it's not dwelling on it, but it is utter fear of it. Um, and the question is, how do we, um, uh, in a sense, cultivate fear? So it's, it's an extraordinary um, claim. 
And, and I think we should distinguish it. I want to distinguish it from the Habesian claim that fear of the state of nature leads men to embrace the state as a, as a, as a protection against the violence of others and thus to a kind of quietism. Uh, I don't think that's Arendt's point at all. Uh, I think what she says is that in the modern world, uh, in the post-totalitarian world, um, it is incumbent upon all of us not to be afraid of the state of nature and our fellow man, uh, but to be afraid and deeply afraid of all pre-totalitarian impulses. To be constantly on the, to, to so understand the dehumanization and uh, anti-human potential and the idea that in a totalitarian state, not only is everything permitted, but everything is possible, including the utter destruction of human beings and collective destruction of human beings, that we must be so attuned to that gruesome and fearsome possibility that we um, are willing to put aside personal safety, right? The Habesian concern and other bourgeois concerns. I know Bob is going to be upset with me for using that word. So let me try and not use it. Put aside concerns of safety and personal comfort. Uh, and look at politics with the eye towards the single question of whether what is happening makes it more or less likely that totalitarianism will emerge. And thus she can say on, on page 442, the fear of concentration camps and the resulting insight into the nature of total domination might serve to invalidate all obsolete political differentiations from right to left and introduce beside and above them the politically most important yardstick for judging events in our time, namely whether they serve totalitarian domination or not. And I personally take that very seriously. Um, and uh, I, I, I take that to be a big part of, of her argument. Um, she makes this, I think, important uh, three-step uh, uh, claim that the, uh, the preparation for the destruction of the human beings happens in three stages and three steps. The first is the killing of the judicial person, then the killing of the moral person, and then the killing of the individual person. I think I went through that in the videotape. Uh, you may not, if, if you haven't had a chance to, to take a look at it, in a sense, the first is the killing of the judicial person that you have rights, and thus the idea that anybody can be arrested or detained or killed um, uh, for no particular reason. The second is the killing of the moral person. And here are the ideas that even in uh, tyrannical and despotic regimes, we always have the right to act morally. We can uh, resist, we can be conscientious objectors, uh, we can even die for our beliefs as martyrs. And in a totalitarian regime, you can't even do that because at the, out, at the, at, at the end, you are disappeared, right? Um, in 1984, this is the idea of, of, of the idea that you, whoever controls the present controls the past, whoever controls the past controls the future. If you die in a kind of resistance, you will simply be erased from history and forgotten, and you lose even that moral ability to die nobly and to die meaningfully. Um, and that is for her um, the great, the killing of the moral person. Um, and, the, and, and the concentration camps are a similar thing. If you die in a hole of oblivion, you, you die in a way that makes no mark on the world. You're disappeared. And finally, the killing of the individual person, namely that um, we are left uh, without any individual traits. We are turned into utter um, superfluous mass individuals um, with no spontaneity, dignity, or honor left. And this, for her, this utter submission um, uh, is the true aim of totalitarian government and is reached only in the camps, and the camps are a laboratory for it. 
Okay, so I'm going to stop there um, on that happy note. Uh, it's a very depressing chapter. Uh, there's no other way to, to parse it. Um, uh, I, I, you know, I, just given the academic year, I end up usually teaching this chapter when I teach this book, you know, a week or two before finals as spring is springing. And it's just a very um, uh, powerful and gray uh, time to, 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 to think about it. So let me stop for a sec, um, see if there's uh, questions and, and, and what people would like to talk about. See, uh, Jack has written one. Um, where does the totalitarian state recruit its agents after the entire population has been rendered um, superfluous? Well, uh, that would be a problem. Um, uh, so uh, I, I think we should say that it's not, you can't render the entire uh, um, population superfluous because you need a party. Uh, you need a inner party and you need a party and you need an outer party. Um, uh, and so on the one hand, um, there are people who aren't superfluous. You need people to rule. Uh, Arendt, in one of her essays uh, on violence, which I think we've read in this group, uh, but we could always read again, um, engages in a, in a speculation, right, uh, at one point on a different topic about, she says, even tyrannical regimes need um, henchmen and thus need some power. People, they need someone who believes in them because they need someone to uh, implement their commands. Um, in a similar way, even totalitarian regimes need a party uh, of willing um, uh, elites. Now, she does say in the On Violence essay that this could change if artificial intelligence were to achieve a state at which the, um, at which the rulers could simply replace all the party bureaucrats with robots and um, machines who would do their bidding at the push of a button. And at that point, you wouldn't need anybody. But we're not there yet, thankfully, uh, although um, one should worry about such a, a scenario. And she does. I think it's to her credit that she has the imagination to think about these questions, uh, writing 40 years, 50 years ago, even on these questions. Um, uh, but she also does say that these um, party members must be increasingly atomized and ideal and, 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 and submitted to an ideology. And so even though they, uh, they're not completely superfluous, they're necessary, they need in a way to be made superfluous. And that's the way totalitarianism rules through creating multiple bureaucracies, multiple uh, overlapping duplicate uh, um, hierarchies so that people can, even the most uh, senior bureaucrats know that they can always be replaced by another and thus are constantly um, uh, wary of being rendered superfluous. And I think that's, you need to then take the next step. Once you're constantly wary of being rendered superfluous, um, how close is that to being superfluous? Um, I think is an important question. Uh, it's not the same. I don't want to say it is. But uh, but I think it's it's not as far as maybe some of us would like. Um, uh, I, there's a couple more questions here. Um, I see John and Carolyn and then Bob. Um, let me quickly answer the the question about experience if I can, and then we'll move on to Carolyn's. Um, while we can't experience totalitarianism directly, so we hope. Uh huh. Great writers can take us there. Kessler and Solzhenitsyn for two of them. Yeah, John. I, 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 I would. Yes. I. By the way, let me say that um, Arthur Kessler's book *Darkness at Noon* is one of the greatest explorations of totalitarianism ever. And while Orwell's is great too, and uh, and I think justly famous, I think um, it would be. It would be great if more people read Kessler's. For those of you interested, I have a long essay on Kessler's Darkness at Noon, which is available widely on the net. Um, and uh, and and I 
I can't recommend reading the book enough. It's, it's, it's a book that um, I wish was more widely read. It's, it's quite widely read, but I wish it was more widely read. But it's, it's, about, um, it's, about, the so it's about the Soviet Union, and uh, the main character is a former Soviet operatic, not operatic, leader, uh, who is arrested and asked to confess to a crime he didn't commit. And they realize that torture will not work on him because he's too uh, principled. But the way they go about getting him to confess is to understand that the entire ideological system he gave his life to, um, the logicality of it, requires that there not be individuals who can resist and that if he believes in his system, he must sacrifice himself to the idea of the party. And um, the internal struggles with himself uh, to come to that conclusion and eventually to accept it um, is one of the greatest illustrations of uh, the totalitarian demand of utter submission and total domination that anyone has ever uh, uh, imagined and put down. Uh, it's simply a brilliant book. Um, and if you haven't read it, uh, I, I, I commend it to you. Um, so yes, John. So Carolyn's question uh, is that in the Atlantic magazine, there was a scary article about ISIS. Yes. Um, the author said that the establishment of the caliphate needed constant growth and movement. He therefore theorized that containing ISIS and not allowing it to spread would cause the movement to wither. <laughs> was he reading this chapter or does this idea emanate? from Islam. Uh, I have no idea if it emanates from Islam. Um, and I want to be very careful about Islam here. Uh, I have, well, I'm not an expert. I have no belief that what ISIS is, is related to Islam in any meaningful sense. Um, uh, uh, I, I, it is clearly Islam, a radical Islamic philosophy and a movement. Uh, but I'm sure there are many other versions of Islam that uh, many people would, 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 would engage and support. Um, but the basic point, Carolyn, is absolutely right. I think there's no doubt that ISIS is a totalitarian movement. Um, you don't have to be a warmonger and uh, a conservative or anything like that to realize that ISIS is undoubtedly a supremely dangerous war movement in search of world domination. Uh, based on uh, an ideology um, and thus something that is deeply dangerous for the world. Um, uh, there's, there's just no uh, way around that. Um, and uh, I don't know if the author was reading, uh, if, if it was David Frum, it's very likely he was because he seems to read Arendt a lot. Um, but I don't know uh, who was doing it and, and who wrote it and if they were reading Arendt. I hope they were. Um, <laughs> What? Say that again. The author was David Frum. Oh well, David is you know is uh is a is, is someone I I enjoy and talk to, and David is uh an avid reader of Arendt. Um, so I would not be surprised, and he certainly reads. I have to say, I'm happy some of the stuff I read in Arendt. So um, I uh, I would not be surprised if he had Arendt in the back of his mind, but I don't know. Um. Was this a recent article or was this a while ago, Carolyn? It was um, maybe two years ago. Okay. Yeah. I mean, if you read his stuff right now, at least on Twitter, he's constantly talking about RN. So, so that's quite interesting. I, yeah. Fascinating. I, I thought I recognized it. But, but I also would say that um, there's a certain aspect about religious principles that uh, – they may not be totalitarian, but they do seek to conquer the world quite often. In religious, that they're accepted by others. I, it's not it's not a political thing, but there is that that growth factor that we have to keep spreading the word and getting other people to accept our beliefs is is sort of interesting. And certainly during certain periods of our time, uh, religious leaders have resorted to terror. Yeah. So I, all I, I think that's fine. That's fair in, in some sense. I do want to just, for those who might be religious and, and a little bit worried about that, say that there should be a distinction made between evangelical religions and non-evangelical religions. 
um, there are many religions that are um, very local and rooted and do not seek to expand. Um, uh, I mean, you know, even the distinction between Judaism and Christianity can be read that way. Um, but, uh, you know, for example, I've been, I've had the fortune in the last couple of months to get to know some people who are members of the Yazidi religion, uh, or the Yazidi people in Iraq, uh, and, and, and elsewhere around there. And their religion is very, to the extent I've come to understand it is a deeply held set of communal beliefs, very much tied to the land and the place they are and the people they are, and is in no way an evangelical uh, religion. Um, uh, Christianity uh, was in, is not, not all Christians are evangelicals, so I want to be clear, but one of the innovations of Christianity um, when it emerged was that it was one of the first religions that claimed to be universal, right? I mean, uh, Greek religion was tied to Greek gods. Uh, the Jewish religion was, again, that the Jews were a, a special and, and chosen people with a certain bond. Um, uh, Christianity was one of the first um, universalist and uh, expansionist religions. Um, and not all religions are like that. And I want to say not all Christians are like that. Are not all Christian forms of Christianity are like that, but um, so I'll, I, I hope that is helpful. Um, Bob asks uh, or says, as there's a question here. Yeah, can't totalitarian regimes develop into something else, such as what almost happened in the Soviet Union with Glasnost, but then developed again into a KGB dictatorship, and then after that, yeah. So um, yes, I mean, you know, one of the things that I hope reading this book has done and, and this is 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 give you some vocabulary to begin thinking about totalitarianism dictatorship fascism authoritarianism um as a series of different concepts that are rarely airtight right i mean one of the things i love about Arendt is she is so insistent on conceptual clarity now, a critique of that can be, well, then she's sort of like an ideologue. She has these conceptual clarities, and none of them ever fully conform with reality. And the answer to that is, of course. Um, she's not actually trying to say, this regime is fully 100% totalitarian and nothing else, and this one is only fascist and not authoritarian, et cetera, et cetera. That's not what this is about. And I hope that as you are getting more familiarity with the book, what you get is a more complicated and nuanced ability to say, all right, let's try and think through this regime that's happening in Turkey right now, or this regime in Iran, or this regime in Syria. And let's try and understand it and see what parts of it are totalitarian, what parts of it are authoritarian, what parts of it are fascist, um, what parts of it are nationalist, what parts are others. And it's an exercise in understanding. Um, and why is that important? Because if you want to resist and you want to understand, you need to have a sense of what you're actually dealing with. And, 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 that, and what Arendt really does offer is, is, is the tools to begin that, that process, or at least that's what I think she does. So, I mean, you know, is Putin's regime totalitarian? Is it authoritarian? Is it fascist? Well, I think you can find elements of all of those in it. As you know, if any of you read the piece I wrote in the uh, Los Angeles Review of Books a few weeks ago, um, you know, there's undoubtedly aspects of the Donald Trump presidency that are, um, uh, that, that, that have elements of what Arendt sees in totalitarian movements. And yet it's also very clear that we are in no way, in my opinion, in a totalitarian regime. So is it useful then to raise the question? Well, I think it is uh, for a couple of reasons. One, because I think we, it helps us understand what's going on. But two, because of what I read before a little while ago, we have to judge events often not simply on left and right, Democrat and Republican, but on um, whether they make it more or less likely that we're uh, going to see the emergence of something like totalitarianism. 
and um, we need to be able to ask those questions. Um, Ian writes, uh, I would love at some point to discuss the point that she closes the chapter with, that quote, in their effort to prove that everything is possible, totalitarian regimes have discovered uh, without knowing it, that there are crimes which men can neither punish nor forgive. What was the implication of this invention of radical evil for her? Why is it important for her that it breaks down all standards we know? Yeah, this is, um, so uh, I, I don't know if Ian is, is asking this within the relation to her book on Eichmann or not, uh, although I imagine he is. Um, but uh, this this raises um, some serious and important, interesting questions. Uh, she clearly in 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 already here in 1950 and uh, in letters to um, Karl Jaspers and then later in the book on Eichmann has already decided or seen that there are crimes that cannot be forgiven. Um, uh, they're crimes which men can neither punish nor forgive. And uh, she, the, the framework here, as I understand it, is, is this. Um, this, this. This is related to some work, some idea she has on the idea of solidarity and reconciliation, um, which she develops in her thought diary, the Denk Tagebuch, and, and elsewhere. Um, but basically, her idea is that um, a crime most crimes are, um, are, 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 are trespasses, right? They are things that we, 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 that are wrongs and that we should punish. And then in punishing them, we, in a sense, reintegrate the idea, the, the criminal back into society. For those of you who've read some Hegel, you know that the basic idea of punishment in Hegelian philosophy, which is very much Western criminal thought, is that um, a wrong is a deviant mind. The wrong is not in what you do. If you kill someone, the harm is the death, but the wrong is the will to kill. It's a deviant will. And what punishment does is it makes the deviant willer feel pain so that he um, gives up his bad will, his impure evil will, and comes back to will the good. And so punishment reintegrates the criminal back into the society by turning him back around from having willed the wrong to willing the good. Um, that's the traditional Hegelian understanding and legal understanding of, of punishment. Um, and what Arendt comes to see is that there are certain crimes, and she thinks the crimes of genocide are, are one of them, um, that are so awful. And so disruptive of the community, of the moral community, the legal community, that um, the idea of simply punishing and reintegrating the criminal and reconciling them and returning them to a world of solidarity is simply, uh, I think she thinks, impossible and, and unethical. That you can't think that's what, you can't think that way. Um, and so, uh, um, I take that to be uh, her point here, uh, that in the effort to prove that everything is possible, totalitarian regimes have discovered without knowing that there are crimes that men can neither punish nor forgive. If they think that everything is possible, they can do crimes like the destruction of the human spirit, the destruction of a race, the destruction thus of human plurality and difference, that in her mind can never be, not only not be forgiven, can't be punished in the sense that they can't you can't think that some pain will reintegrate that person and um and we can't forgive we can't bring them back in we can't reconcile with them and so um they need to be in a sense killed and extinguished from the face of the earth which is the word she uses when she decides to hang eichmann uh, in her judgment of eichmann not because the death is called for as punishment, because it's a symbol of our refusal to integrate that person back into the community. 
And in our judgment of non-integration or non-reconciliation, we make a claim on our co-citizens that our moral community requires the non-integration of that person back into our community. And in doing so, we reconstitute a new solidarity. And that's her argument about reconciliation, that reconciliation is not a product of solidarity, but the cause of solidarity, as is non-reconciliation. Um, So I and, and so that you ask about the breaking down all standards. I think the point is that when someone breaks all standards, when they commit something that's so radical and so evil, we have to, in order to reconstitute solidarity, reconstitute the webs of connection, we can't seek to reintegrate them. We have to expel them and in doing so seek to reintegrate a community without them. I think that's her, her argument here. Um, Mel asks or says, RN quotes, yes, David Rousset, uh, normal men do not know that everything is possible. Yes, this is the epigraph to the chapter and then comes back in this section. Um, but enlightenment thinkers, in particular, the American founders indeed thought that the potential to achieve anything. Um, that's a, okay. It's an interesting thought. Uh, I don't know. Uh, they, they, they certainly thought that they could um, achieve a certain rationalist knowledge. I mean, the Enlightenment thinkers. Uh, I'm not sure exactly what what Mel has in mind. If you want to elaborate, you can. Um, her point is that um, the uh, what normal men do not know that everything is possible is that normal men exist in a world, right? In a world where there are facts, common sense limits, whether the limits come from religion and tradition or whether they come from um, uh, customs and habits or whether they come from a common sense or or just tradition, you know, whatever it is, there are certain things which are just thought beyond the pale. So, for example, I mean, RN's argument is that people like her who were German citizens, German Jews, and fled Germany and thought that the Nazis were just god-awful people. I mean, let's not, you know, pull any punches here. She hated them. She she wrote against them. She worked against them. But when she finally heard about the concentration camps later in the war, she couldn't believe it. She didn't understand that that could happen. Now, one answer is she was naive. Okay? I mean, fine. But it wasn't just her. There were a lot of people who didn't believe it. And they didn't believe it because they thought no way that educated, sane human beings would do such a thing. They just couldn't imagine it. And what she's saying is we were normal. Normal people certainly don't believe that this could happen. And what um totalitarianism and the Nazis and the Bolsheviks or the Stalinists taught, have taught us, is that we can no longer count on normalis, on normalcy. We can't count on that. We, we now know that whatever we think is impossible is possible. And we now have to live in a world in which we confront that. And that comes back to the fear element. Really understanding that has to terrify you. I mean, it has to. Because it means that it is possible that we will decide to blow up the world, to nuke the world, to engage in Armageddon, environmental, nuclear, or otherwise. It is possible that we will torture people and consider it moral and just and part of a, a grand utopian world strategy. There's just no way we can now think that that's beyond the pale of political action. Mel, did you want to add to any of that? You have to turn your well, mic on if you, you do. Yeah, I just did. Can you hear me, Roger? Yes. Uh, yes, I, I cut myself off. I'm not used to using the software here. Uh, I continued my email a couple down, but you answered my question to you was, can we reconcile her optimistic view of the creation of the Republic in origins of uh, revolution 
when uh, Peter Gay and others have said the Enlightenment thinkers thought in just this way, uh, that uh, that everything is possible, including creating a whole new country from scratch and uh, so on. My question to you was, uh, can you uh, can we reconcile this? And I think the answer you just gave was a very fair reconciliation. I emphasize what often is missed in the quote from Rousseau is normal men don't believe that. And the Enlightenment thinkers were more or less normal men. So how would you account for that? And I think you uh, your discussion was uh, excellent in addressing that. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. I mean, I, thank you. And I, 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 you know, I, I don't, I think, I think it's very interesting when you say the, the founders weren't normal men. Um, uh, that's a, that's a, that's an interesting one. I mean, the, one of the things that RN loves about the founders, right. Is their deep root rootedness in the experience of democracy. Um, I mean, if you read that book, one of the things that comes up over and over again is experience. They, they were involved in town hall meetings. They were involved in Congresses. They were involved in dissent. They were involved in the activities of politics. And it's that rootedness in these experiences that in a sense give them a kind of norm, made for them a kind of normalcy in which the possibility of something new like self-government emerged. And um, it emerged not as an ideology, but as a practice. And that, um, that means that even though the practice they uh, developed was somewhat radical and somewhat idealistic, and thus an imagination of something that had never been before, it was deeply rooted in practice and experience in a way that um, the uh, um, about the way the ideological um, claims of totalitarians are not. So, um, but that's just one way to think, you know, off the fly, trying to think that through. Uh, Jack writes, uh, dwelling on camps could draw attention away from some of the preparatory steps that precede the camps can be detected, I see, and resisted long before the leader and his party can gain control, such as ghettoization, solitary confinement, invasions of privacy, etc. Okay, that's fair. Obviously, by saying dwelling on the horrors of the camps, I don't mean ignore the other pre-totalitarian uh, uh, activities. Um, that said, uh, you know, I mean, I think it's fairly obvious, but I, you know, I was speaking at Millerton the other day at this movie theater, and I said, I just want to be very clear. We're not yet in a totalitarian world or situation. And a couple of people stood up and said, you're wrong. Yes, we are, and walked out. Um, you know, and okay, you know, we can disagree, but I think it's important for those of us who are trying to responsibly talk about these themes to remind us that at the very essence of totalitarianism is this extraordinary uh, dehumanization, which has its um, culmination in camps. That doesn't mean that uh, we should, you know, the fact that it doesn't exist and we're not in that doesn't mean we shouldn't be wary. I think part of the reason I'm teaching this book and announce this course, which began, as many of you know, on the day of the inauguration, well, there were two reasons, right? At least one was too many people in my mind were irresponsibly throwing around the word totalitarianism. And I thought it would be helpful for some people to think more deeply about that under RN's tutelage. And the second is that I actually do believe that there are totalitarian impulses. By the way, I think there are totalitarian impulses on the left as well as the right. I think if you've been with me for the last 10 weeks of this course, you probably have picked up on that. Um, and I, uh, I think the dangers are, are fairly widespread and, and deeply interwoven with a lot of, um, uh, a lot of, uh, uh, a lot of our culture and we need to be aware of them. But I think right now they're very apparent, uh, in the current self described movement that the president has imagined himself to be the leader of. And, um, so I thought it was worth, uh, looking at it from that point of view. Um, Ron uh, writes, it seems to me that the most evangelical of contemporary religions is secular. Ah, 
That's an excellent question. These, the global domination of corporate capitalism, or what is sometimes called economism, or endless economic growth at all costs, at any sacrifice. I, I think that's an excellent question. I mean, uh, I will tell you that at Bard College, and I don't think we're an outlier on this, um, I was at a retreat uh, last year with a bunch of young students, uh, largely around questions of race and, 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 and oppression and things. And they asked people in the audience, you know, in the, the participants to, to separate and talk about and go find the group where they found they most identified with as a minority or as an oppressed minority. And what surprised everyone is that a huge number of students, including a huge number of the minority students, did not go to the racial groups, but went to the religious groups. Um, and when we began talking about it, uh, the argument was that it is much easier to be, um, or at least much more accepted at Bard, at least, maybe not in the culture outside of Bard, but at Bard, to be um, black or, 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 or gay or uh, other minorities than it is to be Christian. Um, uh, and that was at least the claim that was made there. Uh, there's a deep and abiding suspicion of religion in secular culture. I don't think you can deny that. Um, secular culture makes a claim that it is an all-encompassing uh, explanatory system. And to the extent that it um, uh, denies the truth, value, and meaning of religion, uh, it is evangelical and it is um, ideological. And so I think for all of those of us who are secular uh, or not, uh, it is important to remember that secularism should not or may maybe should not be turned into an ideology. Um, obviously, you know, in some places it is and some people will defend it as an ideology. Um, capitalism uh, as another ism. Uh, you know, if you read Max Weber on capitalism, I mean, one of the things you learn very quickly is once you have a capitalist economy, anyone who tries to run a business in a non-capitalist way will be destroyed because they will not be able to compete with the efficiencies of a capitalist business. And uh, we now live in a world in which if a company is not growing, uh, it will largely be, it will often, and I think eventually, uh, have, its, its costs will go up uh, and will have to be, and will become uncompetitive with um, other companies that do things better with different technologies, with lower costs, with better um, scales, uh, economy of scales. And so there is a religion of growth in the economy, according to Weber, and of capitalist economy. And that means that if you just want to have a little bank or a little cafe and not grow and just run your cafe the way it is, um, it will be increasingly complicated, if not impossible to do that, unless you have a benefactor who will support you in your esoteric uh, economic uh, way of living. So um, I, I think that's true. If anyone wants to comment on any of these or or uh, respond i know i've been talking a lot uh i can continue there's still more questions but i want to make sure you feel uh that you can if there are things you want to add um akeli uh writes i found a smart discussion with a solid theoretical theoretical approach to the relationship between religion and state power while it is about isis and Islam, the connections he draws are useful. And so, okay, you can take a look at that. John writes, I took RN's thesis of radical evil to be the only justification for capital punishment. Did she mean that? Um, so, uh, first of all, um, no. Uh, but on a technical level, John, because capital punishment is still punishment. Um, and Radical evil is that which is beyond punishment. So uh, um, uh, you can have capital punishment, but that's not um, based on radical evil. That would be based on simply a crime in which the punishment is death. Um, 
one of the great uh, disputes in legal theory, which is my old hat, right? If I, I was a legal theorist long before I was an Arendt scholar, um, one of the great disputes in, in, in legal theory is um, if punishment is the reintegration of the criminal back into the moral community, and it's about turning the will from the wrong, the crooked, the tortious path back to the straight, right, recht, richtig path, um, how can that happen with capital punishment? Because you erase the person from the moral community. But of course, for Hegel and for um, criminal law at its time of development, the moral community is um, a spiritual Christian community uh, that uh, includes the uh, um, includes the soul uh, after death. And so capital punishment is the reintegration of a soul. And uh, for someone whose wrong is so great that they took upon themselves the right to kill another being, um, their reintegration can only happen if they suffer a, a, a pain that is equal in intensity to the wrongness of their wrong. And, um, and thus that means with death. Um, I, I I don't know Arendt's actual view on capital punishment within legal theory. I, I have no memory of her ever discussing it. Her defense of the of the killing of Eichmann is not a defense of capital punishment. It's a defense of killing someone whose wrongs are so extreme and radical that they can't be punished and thus must be as a as it as an almost symbolic and aesthetic act must be erased from the earth as a sign that we um, reject them as someone who can be reintegrated in the community and thus make a claim that we all must reject them in this way and in doing so reestablish our ethical and moral bonds as members of a community. I hope that makes sense, um, John. Um, yeah, sure. Thanks a lot. Yeah. Bob writes, be very careful about demonizing evangelicals. I wasn't trying. I hope I didn't do that. I, I, I didn't mean to demonize them. Uh, I simply meant to say that uh, there's a difference between religions that are um, that are limited and that are uh, uh, universal on the one hand, and then also between limited and universal religions and evangelical religions. Um, but I'll, let me re read the whole question. American evangelicals come in many different flavors, that's for sure. Even the very idea, if we can say that there is a very idea of evangelicism, its effort to bring the word to others need not be considered bullying or worse. No, I fully, okay, I, I fully agree. For some evangelicals, it is enough just to bear testimony to lead by example. Any idea, any faith, any concept can be made profoundly ugly, any Mormon are Mormon missionaries, bullies, mitigators of human pain, something in between both the other. So yeah, I, I, I if I implied opposite, I want to deeply apologize. Um, what I was trying to say is that there are some religions that simply um, don't seek to uh, bring others into them that are very much rooted in a, a place and practice. There are other religions like all Christianity, evangelical and not, which are um, universalist and uh, seek uh, to bring the word to others, as I've just said. Um, then there's more, more, there's very many flavors, but there's more or less evangelical uh, religions, which seek not just to bring the word to others, but see it as their, uh, that in some sense, as a, as a moral requirement to, um, to bring the world and seek to convert others. Uh, they can do so in, in more peaceful and uh, aggressive and more aggressive and less aggressive ways. Um, but insofar as they see their uh, truth and their word as something that others need in order to be saved, uh, which is, I, I, I will stick to it, that the way some evangelical um, religions um, do understand it, uh, there is a tendency in those religions to um, see those who don't hear the word as lesser. Um, and uh, 
That doesn't mean that they will become violent and it doesn't mean that they will become totalitarian at all. I just think that there is an evangelicism, uh, 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 an, an ideological element um, that uh, that is something um, that we should be aware of and can become dangerous, but does not need to. Maybe I'm happy to have Bob come back at me because these are important questions and he probably knows a lot more about evangelicism than I do. But um, Bob, do you want to continue? When I was mentioning the terror, I was thinking of the Inquisition. <laughs> so <laughs> that, that's who I was referring to. Anyway. Right. All right. Well, um, which, which is superior or which is worse uh, to be exclusive, to, uh, to not want anybody else to join your group, your religion? or to make it universal. I mean, this is, this is the argument or the issue between Christianity and Judaism. And I could see it going both ways. And in fact, uh, with many ideas, I can see them going both or even more than both ways. I think it's a function maybe of the moment, uh, the historical moment of the, evangel of the particular religion or idea. And it's also a function of, of who's in charge. Uh, I'm trying to think of that guy in Jonesville. I mean, he, he might have started out, you know, an, an attractive uh, fellow with an idea, and he he grew into something horrific. Yeah, I, I you know, I, I I hope that's the spirit that I that I'm trying to speak about this in as well as Bob. I'm not trying to say one is better and one is worse. Um, I, I think that, uh, there are, I, I think you're right that, you know, when I, I used to teach a course in which I would have a section on, um, Christian critiques of Judaism. Um, not cause I was actually that interested in Jewish and Christian, you know, disputes, but because Judaism was seen as a, a religion of, of the text and the law and Christianity of the heart. Uh, that the rules are in your heart and that these this critique uh you know is one that can be seen as meaningful right why should we have this kind of legalism of the book we should have the spirit of the law and we should interpret law in the spirit of the law not by the rules right these are constant legal debates so it was a it was a parallel <laughs> between these two and yet then there's also um dangers of when you try and you know look past the law and look to the spirit of the law if the interpreter is one you don't trust uh it can lead to um it can lead to uh dangerous situations my you know my view is that there are amazingly brilliant and great uh uh values in both Judaism and 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 Christianity um uh in the end um uh you know if you want to think of it this way Judaism is a is a religion in which certain of its elements lend itself more towards a kind of um, legalistic authoritarianism, and Christianity is a religion which, in its um, evangelicism and in its internal uh, rejection of, of of the words in the name of the Spirit, uh, can be uh, 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 misused in a kind of totalitarian way, um, but. That is not to say that either of them in their true sense are either authoritarian or um, totalitarian. Well, because parenthetically, just... this is what uh, Merchant of Venice is all about. Yes. The, uh, the legalism much. versus yeah, faith, exactly. forgiveness, love. Yeah. Is there another point? Yes, Someone? I was going to make a point. Can you hear me? Yes. Barry, um, it seems to me that at at the bottom of all of this discussion of the chapter today, as well as the conversation right now, uh, is the question about the public sphere and truth. Um, and that is that in, in a liberal society, and I use the word in a very large and generic sense, um, statements, public statements must be con are contestable and must be testable. Uh, totalitarianism or any kind of uh, enforced dogmatism, of course, obviates that. And that I think is where the crucial difference lies. Uh, in the chapter that we read today, the destruction of moral man, of the moral individual, 
means that that person is deprived of the ability to contest a statement, uh, to contest a, uh, a law, to contest any kind of uh, promulgation. Uh, and of course, we take that all the way to totalitarianism. Um, just short of totalitarianism is absolutism, uh, which may be more germane for a present day conversation than the uh, than totalitarianism. But nevertheless, I think that the whole point is that the moral society must be built upon the idea of the contestable proposition. Uh, losing that, we lose our individuality uh, and we become mass man. Barry, it's a, you know, it's, it's a, it's a fascinating claim. Um, and, uh, and so if I understand it, you know, you, the, the, end, the, the way you put it at the end is very gespitzed uh, to the point. Um, and uh, it, it's something along the lines, well, I'm going to try and repeat what you said, because that was very nice, which is that a moral society must be a society of contestation. Um, you know, interestingly enough, there are a lot of moral societies or what people would call moral societies that are societies in which people are largely taught a religion and taught a tradition. And it's thought that morality means accepting those basic rules and beliefs, not contesting them. Now, under a liberal enlightenment idea, those are considered a kind of, you know, autocratic and heteronymous idea in which the law is imposed from above and not from below. But I'm not, so I, all I want to say is I'm not fully prepared to say that you can't have an ethical or moral society that is a traditional society in which people um, come to learn and embrace the truth of a religion or a tradition and it's a society of largely, um, uh, ex, you know, habituated and educated conformity in a religious way. Um, I'm not prepared to say that that's an that that we, that that can't be a moral society. Um, I think today it's very hard to imagine such a society uh, existing without a kind of oppression um, in a in a in a in our world, but I think it's possible and. Um, one of the reasons I am more open to, for example, I will defend the right of Islamic parents to send their children to Islamic schools, um, even I would say even Islamic public schools, is because I'm open to the idea that people can build a moral world um, for them and their families and their children and their community that is based on faith, if that's how they want to build a moral world. Roger, let me just say that I'm not talking about voluntary associations, such mm -hmm. as a, a religion where people may indeed adopt a, a point of view and a dogma uh, as part of their faith. What I am saying is in the public sphere, uh, there ought to be openness and contestation. And that is where uh, liberal societies begin to break down as more and more of the public space is taken up with lies. Which is yeah. a very Hannah Arendtian. Yeah. Problem. Okay. So then, then I then I agree. Chapter. Yeah. Then then we're in heated agreement, Barry. I I I, I apologize if I misunderstood what you no, said. No, no, no. Um, you know, I, I think that's right. And and at that point, um, in the public sphere as opposed to in a social sphere of association, as Barry rightly put it, um, there there any attempt to assert a truth, uh. Is, is is out of place for Hannah Arendt. And I think she's, to me, uh, convincing on this. Um, the, the, the hard part then, and, and this is the part we're struggling with now, is that once, if it is true that there are no truths in the public sphere, how do we nevertheless embrace and assert facts uh, in the public sphere without which we don't have a common world around which we can all gather and around which we can all agree. And um, what in, what's interesting is that the loss of facts has emerged at a time in which um, there is an ever deeper belief among most people on both sides that they know the truth. Um, we live at a time right now where 
people on multiple sides of issues, left, right, and I think there's other sides, uh, libertarian, uh, populist, um, racial issues, gender issues, however we want to put it, religious issues. Um, people believe they've figured out the truth. And as they become more and more convinced that they have the truth, they develop their own factual worlds that supports that truth. And there are other truths and their own factual worlds and the common world um, is breaking down. And, uh, and that is to me uh, very much the situation uh, we're in right now. And if that is the case, if I'm right, the challenge, the first way to reestablish a common world is to is for people to come to admit and recognize that they don't know the truth. We need to bring humility and openness and a respect for plurality back into our public lives. And that is to me the most important and challenging project um, that we can all engage in. Uh, I think having a reading group like this where we talk to each other and, and, and listen uh, is, is part of that kind of project. Is that all right, Barry? Is that fair? That's very fair, indeed. Okay. Um, I got to figure out where I am here. Uh, John writes that Gary Wills in the latest New York View of Books points out that the founders wrote the Constitution in a period between two great evangelical awakenings. The question is, could the founders have done what they did during the his other historical periods? Um, you know, uh, that is a question beyond my pay grade. Uh, you know, I, I think it's, I think it's without a doubt, it's a situated event and without, I think it wouldn't have happened in a different place in a different time. Uh, RN thinks that the United States was a fairly unique situation. The, uh, uh, it was a place of religious dissidence. It was a place where people, because they came to a, a land where even though there were people there, inhabitants, they thought themselves as inhabiting a, a terra nulla. They engaged in self-government from the beginning and became this experience of government, which really, in her mind, um, if it had ever existed before, had never existed in Europe. Um, and she she thinks it's that the you can't understand the American constitutional tradition without understanding that situated experiential history of the founders. Um, uh, so certainly from place and time, she doesn't think so. Uh, whether it had to do with the being between two evangelical traditions, I don't know. Um, Ron writes, where in Weber is it worth Worrisome that in returning to my hometown, Baltimore, last year, I was struck by how much the ghetto areas with cameras in every corner, police cars everywhere, surplus people on the streets, once fine homes, now like barracks. I'm sorry, I'm not sure I understand the question, Ron. Um, I was struck by how much the ghetto areas. I'm not sure I understand it. Uh, happy to... Um, and I don't uh, know, though, Babe, uh, Babe or Rep. Roger, you were, you were speaking of the pre-totalitarian possibilities of camps and uh, riding on those streets. I was not thinking of Arendt. I was not thinking of totalitarianism, but it was a massive and very powerful impression uh, from uh, seeing those uh, communities that um, were like camps somewhat somewhat like camps I, that that's that's all it was just a uh, uh simply a very powerful uh, yeah. experience because that was my uh, community where my <clears throat> grandparents once lived and uh, it was uh, uh, a very different community than i had ever uh, experienced in in my youth um, mm -hmm. But I am also interested in the question of where in Weber does he make this uh, claim, which I find extremely perceptive, that um, uh, capitalism requires uh, a kind of a, a powerful ideology, really, of growth, 
which seems to be the uh, where we are <laughs> almost universally in the clutches of that ideology today. Yeah. Uh, well, the easier question I'll answer first, the last one. Um, I, if you've ever read Protestant Ethic and the Spirit of Capitalism, um, yes, uh, Weber, yes. Is that where it is. Okay. There's yeah. There's a discussion of um, of uh, what's it called? Peace workers or whatever, P I E C E or or what are they called? The, you know the the people who do work here and there. And there's a discussion of you know mom and pop stores or farms. I mean, he doesn't call them mom or pop, but that's my translation. Um, you know, and what he says is that these, these will have to disappear in capitalism. They can't in the end hold out because they, they go against, you can't just want to make enough to live happily because if you do so over time, your store or your business will be um, overrun and made uh, inefficient by those who are trying to maximize profit. And as a result, it forces everybody to engage in capitalism if they want to survive. Um, and so it's, it's, it, it's a discussion that's in the Protestant ethic and, and the spirit of Thank capital. You. Thank you. That's, that was terribly prescient. <laughs> yeah, so he was a very prescient man. Um, Weber's someone we should all be reading. Um, uh, on your question about totalitarianism and 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 your return to to um, uh, Baltimore, uh, you know, I, I think this is we had a conference on privacy and surveillance two years ago at the Aron Center. I'm sure some of you were there, and some of you have watched the videos from it. Uh, and we we spent a lot of time talking about these kind of questions. Um, I mean, there's no doubt we're living in a world where um, every one of us, you know, if the government wanted to, they could be listening in on this uh, conversation with almost no effort. Uh, when we finish and we turn our computers off, that little camera on your computer can be turned on by the CIA or the FBI if they want to. And they can listen and watch what you're doing. Your cell phone is a is a is is basically a tracking device as effective as um, if you were wearing an ankle bracelet. Um, so uh, we are all surveilled uh, on a regular basis, and uh, I think one of the you know difficult phenomenological sociological questions that we will ask ourselves in the coming years and decades is to what extent universal surveillance um, changes and threatens human spontaneity and freedom. Uh, um, that is, uh, without a doubt, um, a, a question that I don't have uh, a definite answer to. Uh, I think and one of my favorite science fiction authors, a guy named Samuel Delaney, some of you may or may not have read him someone I was obsessed with many years ago, um, has a, a book, I think it's Triton, I'm not sure which book it is, but I believe it's Triton, in which there's a, a wonderful uh, sub-theme in which um, whenever somebody was feeling depressed and lonely and unimportant, they could go into an old phone booth, which of course was no longer a phone booth, and pick up the, <laughs> pick up the phone and they would get a video of them being surveilled by the government and the premise of this would make you feel important again because you were important enough that the government actually had surveillance of you um it was sort of a, a comment on those who during the 60s and 70s would request their fbi file and if they didn't have one would feel depressed um uh in any case um uh you know what mass surveillance will do to us uh, is a fascinating question. And um, uh, and um, I think without a doubt, it will change behaviors, uh, whether it will um, change and endanger freedom and spontaneity is a, is a more difficult question that I'm not sure there's a simple answer to. Um, so as, and you know, and the economic, the socioeconomic um, distinctions between, uh, I mean, there, there is no doubt that the wealthier you are, 
the more capacity you have now to avoid surveillance, right? Let's just start there. Um, obviously, if you're put in a prison, which is a kind of camp, but not an extermination camp, let's be very clear, and not a concentration camp, but something of a camp in which you're disappeared from the public sphere and you can be surveilled on a regular basis. But even living, you know, people who have the ability to build homes that are large and fortress-like and protected from and have hedges that protect them from the street and can protect themselves from Google Earth or whatever it is um, and can create, uh, you know, firewalls and have, you know, internet blocking technology, um, you know, they have the ability to isolate themselves and protect themselves and find um, pockets of privacy that for many people who have to go and register at food stamps and register at the welfare office and register to go to school and are constantly registering and being fingerprinted and being surveilled do not have. Uh, and so um, there is without a doubt a socioeconomic uh, and I think even racial, depending on where you live, at least somewhat racial, um, a distinction of of surveillance. And so, um, you know, these are whether, you know, but again, none of this so far is at the level of totalitarianism and the destruction and domination of the human spirit, as far as I'm concerned. I mean, we could have that discussion. Suzanne writes, can we look a bit longer on one of the most frightening sentences of this chapter 459? Great. Political, social, and economic events everywhere are in a silent conspiracy with totalitarian instruments devised for making men superfluous. Excellent. Uh, this would be a good place to, to, to bring us to a close today. Um, uh, so this is in this part of the chapter that I mentioned at the beginning was added in the second edition of the book. This was not in the first edition of the book. Um, and um, these ideas about totalitarianism and logical consistency um, then become expanded in the second and future editions of the book into the next chapter on ideology and terror. Um, so, uh, political and social and economic events everywhere are in a silent conspiracy with totalitarian instruments devised for making men superfluous. So the, the basic insight here is that totalitarianism is so dangerous today because it actually answers a desire and a need of modern society. Um, Modern society renders increasing numbers of people superfluous uh, through uh, um, automation and through uh, the rise of technology uh, and through ideology. Um, uh, it is simply the case that large numbers of people are not necessary for the economy and are, if anything, um, sort of a drag on our moral, political, and economic lives. Uh, I mean, just think about the way so many people in what we might call the bipartisan technocratic elite feel about the masses today. Couldn't we just get rid of them? I hate to be so blunt, but I think that's the that's what lies behind the deplorables comment. Um, and, uh, you know, it used to be you needed them to do the work, but it's not going to be so clear that that's the case anymore. I'm, I'm being as provocative and honest as I can on this state. Uh, you may, I hope I'm not offending people, but I may be, and I, I'm not worried about doing so because I think it's an offensive idea. But um, uh, I think Arendt is, is saying here that there is an, a strong temptation um, to do away with people who are inconvenient. Um, and as she says in the last sentence of this chapter here, totalitarian solutions may well survive the fall of totalitarian regimes in the form of strong temptations 
which will come up whenever it seems impossible to alleviate political, social, or economic misery in a manner worthy of ban. Uh, um, in times of economic and political crisis, camps, surveillance, um, dehumanization will become uh, temptations, strong temptations. And so um, what we're here opening up, and this is going to be the subject of, in a way, the next chapter, Ideology and Terror, is the deeply rooted connection between totalitarianism and um, contemporary society um, that Arendt wants us to uh, dwell on. Um, yeah. Uh, and there's a connection as well between the um, lust for consistency, as she calls it on page 458, um, that we see in ideologies of totalitarianism and in all other isms, uh, capitalism, socialism, uh, etc., even humanism. Um, which is a contempt for reality, which makes possible changing the world. And um, this contempt for reality is also a contempt for those people who are preventing us from living in our fantasy world, those who we find inconvenient. And so all ideological systems that want to make the world uh, into a utopian image, whether it's human rights or uh, liberalism or populism or conservatism and find those who resist our ideology to be people who are inconvenient and, 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 you know, blockages in the machine, um, become, uh, well, become people who are expendable and in fact would make the world run better if we got rid of them. And, and that is the, that is the, uh, um, that is the uh, temptation of all ideological thinking that she finds um, rooted in the modern rise of scientific thinking. But we have to be careful, not real science, but what she calls pseudoscience or ideological thinking, which is not geared towards actual uh, disprovable hypothetical science, but a science which seeks to establish a theory and fit reality to that theory. Um, and that is the, uh, that is the, uh, that she sees our age is uniquely susceptible for that because in our world, we have these lonely, rootless, homeless, isolated masses who desperately want consistency. And um, those masses are, are of all classes and social classes, but they are also um, people who need a kind of consistency. And uh, therefore, they embrace these collective fantasies. There are others who are in their way. And totalitarianism is an ever tempting solution to the irritation of not being able to implement our collective ideological fantasies with the efficiency that we would like. So that's going to be the topic of our last conversation next week on ideology and terror. It'll be a joy. Um, it's a very, like, this is a very uh, uh, depressing book in many ways. I will promise you, though, that it has a happy ending, right? The last page is happy. Uh, is optimistic, and um, we will hope to spend some time both on on both sides of it for next week. Um, one thing I'd love you to do, if you're if you have the time, is to maybe think about what you might delete, read next. I think we're going to take a couple weeks off. I have to um, before we start again. This has been a, a an intense reading group, and I've really enjoyed it. 
But um, maybe at the end of our discussion next time, we can spend a couple minutes thinking about what people would like to read next. Um, for now, uh, please uh, do enjoy. I hope you, I'm sorry we sent the, the video late this week in preparation, but if you haven't listened to it, watched it, you might want to. Um, and we will uh, continue next week with our last session on ideology and terror. Thanks all very much, and I hope you enjoy continuing to read Hannah Arendt. Do you Thank you, Roger. Thank mm -hmm. you.